You just really hear it's about Abe. About the, an AJ story, and even that is enough. And, and and his contribution not to be minimized. No, but even oh, yeah. even the even the AJ story that they get from the book is not anywhere near complete because he doesn't mention a lot of the theaters. He only mentions a few. Th For some reason, it's, it's curious. Okay, let me just hear how the sound is. Just talk a little bit. Well, I'm looking forward to doing right, this. Good. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. All right. So, um, that's great. And I heard a story that when Elmer died, Bob called the Theater Historical Society in Elmhurst, which inherited a lot of the materials from the theaters when this Mr. Plitt took over oh, yeah. and cleaned out the basement. Mm -hmm. And apparently, they're a little stodgy, and they weren't as nice to him as they should have been. Mm -hmm. And they were like, I don't know anything No, no, about I'm just that. giving you, you know, I don't know, I'm giving you the details that go beyond, you know. Just we never got anything out of the theater. My father never took so much as an ashtray out of the theater. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm talking about like photos yeah. and information and that type of thing. Trying to see a little shine on there. I want to just make sure. Do, do I look what, what we expect me to look like? Sort of. Really? Yeah, like your dad did when he was Thomas. young. Yeah. Big. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was th I was slimmer when I was younger. <laughs> trying to get that back, my wife wants me to desperately. Okay. We can talk more about those things, I guess, at lunchtime because yeah, you have to do this first. Mm -hmm. You can put your feet up. Yeah. Just trying to tone down the light a little bit. People don't like it when they have, especially ladies don't want to have shine on their, on their feet. Let me change. All right, now it looks good, everything, but because of the light being kind of hot, um, do you want to put a little pop, like, it's just a little, it's shut, is it, I think the lights make, like, see how I'm sweating? I can't even I'm, tell. <laughs> yeah, I have a little sweat on my brow. Uh, uh -huh. um, I'm not. No, okay. So I just have to kind of tone that down a little bit to, so it doesn't look so, it's a little bright. Just do a little test recording to make sure that you're looking in the right direction since I don't have the benefit of someone standing behind the camera. So let's just do a, a pretend to answer for the first question. So Ida, when did you first become aware of your family's business? Well, I think I knew about it from the time I was very little because my father used to take me uh, to the Tivoli, which he managed when he was a younger fellow in the business. And it was a beautiful theater, as really they all were. Okay, stop there. And then I'm just going to make sure that, that it's looking as good as it, I think it is. When did you first become aware of your family's business? From the time I was a little kid. My dad used to talk about the theaters, and he used to take me to them. Uh, the first one I remember is the Tivoli, which was one of the first ones in the company, I think, and was not so far from where we lived. It was very beautiful, it was well known. They had gorgeous stage shows there, as did all the theaters in those days. And, you know, they were full of marble and gorgeous things around and so on. I was always impressed. I always got a sort of a kick out of it. And uh, I used to go to all the theaters with him. In fact, when I was a little bit older, if I was a good girl on a certain evening when he would go around and visit the theaters and talk to the managers and check up and so forth, I used to go and visit 
all of them were. One of the most gorgeous was the South Town. Uh, it had a marble swimming pool in the lobby with swans in it, for heaven's sake. And it was very impressive. <laughs> and they were gorgeous and they were immaculate and the, the people who worked in them were immaculate. Uh, uh, they had, my father used to tell me that uh, people from society families sort of used to ask if they would employ their sons as ushers because they thought they were treated as if they were cadets in a military school or something. They had to look as, as a certain way, ab absolutely impeccably dressed and their hands and, uh, clean and, and gloves and, and um, you know, trim and so forth. No, no beards and mustaches like today and long hair and all that stuff, you know. Uh, and it was designed to be family entertainment. You would never hear anything off color or risque or anything in any of the shows. Gorgeous costumes in the stage shows. And of course, when I was a kid, I wasn't so interested in the stage shows. I liked to watch the movies. But anyway, for a preliminary question, I hope that yeah. is okay. Um, so where did, tell us a little bit about where you, your family made their home in, uh, where your family first made your home? Well, we always lived on the south side. When I was so small that I hardly remember, we lived on University Avenue, which is near the University of Chicago. Why don't we ask that again, because you, you, when you went to oh, your okay. face, it, 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 uh, okay. okay. So the question is, um, where did your family first make their home? Well, when I was very small, we lived on University Avenue, which was near the University of Chicago. Then we moved to the Jackson Towers, which is still a flourishing apartment building. I guess it's a condominium now, at 55th and the lake and on Jackson Park. And then we moved to New York when I was about six for a few years. And uh, when we came back, we moved into the Powhatan, which is also still a beautiful building at 50th and the lake. And uh, I grew up there. Uh, I, I loved it. Uh, it was beautiful. And uh, it was a wonderful area to live in and to grow up in. Okay, what was, can you uh, paint the picture to someone who doesn't really know much about Chicago? What was, Chica what was Chicago like back when you were a child? Well, when you're a child, you don't see the city as an adult sees it. Uh, it was always uh, wonderful for me. I, I grew up feeling, you know, uh, very, what should I say? Uh, very fortunate and very privileged. I knew that. I always knew that. And um, I don't think we were s spoiled in the way some people mean that. We were indulged, I suppose you have to say that. But our folks had good values. They, they came from very humble beginnings. My grandparents were all immigrants. Daddy's parents were immigrants and so were moms. And uh, they were poor. My mother worked when she was young, and my d dad, of course, worked before he was in the, the company that became Balaban and Katz. And, w and they never let us forget it either. So we weren't supposed to be wise guy kids, and, and I don't think we were. And uh, the this, this city, of course, was a city of neighborhoods. It really still is, more than a lot of other cities. So that if you, the, the south side where we lived was really the center of, um, I suppose, a middle, upper middle class or, or urban Jewish community and university community. And not too far from the very well known at that time hospital, Michael Reese Hospital, which was, quote, the Jewish hospital because it was founded by Jewish families. And so I was certainly always aware of all of this. Uh, I saw downtown as a child when I went, you know, with my mother to go shopping or to the dentist or something, and then to meet at, at the Chicago Theater where Dad's office was. And while we would wait for Dad to get ready to go home, I would sit in the theater. I saw every act that even almost now that you know about, I can remember seeing almost everybody who became a, a major movie or a television star, because they, uh, if they were entertainers, they appeared at the Chicago. And many of the people, oh, that isn't what you asked me, of course. That's okay, you yeah. don't have to worry about that. Okay, uh, many of the people who worked for the company went on to Hollywood and New York and made very big careers for themselves. Um, the, uh, 
uh, some of the men who uh, conducted the music in the theaters became the heads of music departments at the major studios in Hollywood. The art directors became art directors in Hollywood. I remember my mother telling me that they knew Vincent Minnelli as a very young man because he was an art director uh, there and so on. And all the major stars um, uh, appeared there. Um, Sinatra, Bob Hope, Judy Garland, when she was a child, before she became such a big star. And we, we got to, I got to know Judy a little and saw her after that uh, sometimes. And, um, and she was sweet. She was a darling person. And uh, I, I, Tony Bennett, uh, I don't remember, um, I'm trying to think, George Burns, Burns and Allen, of course, Jack Benny. I mean, all these people appeared at the theater. Lena Horne, Louis Armstrong. Uh, I remember that. Would you like to go on to another subject and get? Well, uh, if you're, is, if you're, I mean, because uh, I thought there was another question fine. later on. No, you're doing okay. fine. I mean, okay. that's good. It, as I said, it's very natural yeah. because I can cut and yeah. paste, and yeah. you don't have to worry about stressing about it, talking too much. So, um, do you have any um, uh, specific memories of uh, being a little girl in Chicago that um, might help us to to understand what it was like? Uh, Things that may, little details of the neighborhood or your schooling or anything. Like oh, that. sure. Uh, well, my brother and I went to what is now known as the Lab School. It's the elementary and high school part of the University of Chicago, and it was all integrated. You could go from nursery school through graduate school. And uh, when we moved back from New York, uh, we were uh, enrolled there. And it was wonderful. I mean, here you were, a part of a great university. Our gymnasium had an Olympic-sized swimming pool in it, for heaven's sake. In the playground, baseball fields, you know, and so on, that a, a university would have, and great libraries and all. We had a garden we used to, uh, they used to uh, have us keep and tend to and so forth. And uh, the city, of course, was very safe. We had an Irish setter. And when I was about 12 years old, I remember, uh, it was my chore to take this dog out about 10 o'clock at night. And that was just an accepted thing. Nobody was concerned that a girl of 12 years old was out with a dog walking around the building in the neighborhood and so forth. And I wasn't frightened. I wasn't concerned. And uh, of course, the city was segregated, something I wasn't aware of at the time. I was aware uh, later on that the theaters were segregated. And my dad took great pride in the fact that he desegregated the theaters. Uh, and desegregated uh, the company to a considerable extent that probably nobody else had done at the time. There was a very uh, well-known theater that they had on the south side in a black community called the Regal. And they had great shows there. And uh, Dad saw to it, he put in a black manager and uh, other staff and so on, so that people wouldn't think, you know, it was just the white people doing this to be nice and so forth. And it worked out very well. And he was, uh, we were all proud that he had done that because he was among the first, if not the first, to do that. And I n uh, hardly ever got to, uh, to, the, to the North Side much. Uh, because I was too young to go by myself and I'd have to go with my parents. And, uh, which I did from time to time. When I went to camp, I had friends who came from other parts of the city. And uh, as far as the city itself is concerned, I mean, the child, I, mean, I would go yeah. to Marshall Fields and that sort of thing. But what does a child see? You know, it's, it's not like an adult having an adult perspective, really, of what the city is like. I knew that there were poor parts of the city. And that always frightened me. If we went through a very poor section, I would kind of cower, I think, in the back of the car. And I'm an adopted child, and uh, I always had that awareness that there, but for the grace of God, might go I. And so I didn't want to be reminded that, that anything like that could have happened to me, maybe. But I was aware. And um, so I was very glad when we got back to the better neighborhoods, you know? Mm -hmm. Let me just check. We're doing really good. We're about half done. Um, 
So um, that's so fascinating. You know, I w when I was at the Chicago Theater yesterday, I noticed um, all the signatures. Have you been back there in a long time? Or? No. If you would you would you like to go there? Well, sometime, sometime yeah. Yeah, because what the, signatures where? All of like Judy Garland. Where Michael, are the pictures? What are you talking about? In the back walls. Of what? The staircase of the of the staircase? Chicago Theater. All, during they, the, all the, during oh, they all put these pictures years. up in the staircase? Not the pictures. All the performers, it was, it's a tradition that they sign the wall. In oh, the that I don't theater. remember. And there's in the back of the theater? And you yeah, mean the stage? Behind, sta behind stage. Oh, behind stage. No, I didn't. So, know. if we, you know, yeah. maybe sometime we could, yeah. we, could, uh, we could check that out. Anyway, so um, how did... Um, You answered the question about the great, some of the great shows and people that you've met, um, I think. Um, what about, um, what exactly did, did your dad do in the business? Well, he started uh, as a younger man before he came into the company. He was a film salesman. And then Uncle Barney and Uncle Abe, I guess, uh, persuaded him to come into the company that they had started. They were older. They were uh, many years older. There were th three or four brothers and a sister between Uncle Barney and uh, my dad. And uh, because they thought he was very good, you know. And uh, so he came in, and I remember that he said, and my mother said, he came in at less salary because he wanted to start. He wanted to be in the company, wanted to be in the business and help make it grow. Uh, and he started, I think, as the manager of the Tivoli Theater, which was sort of a big deal in those days. And then he gradually, I guess, or not so gradually, moved up so that he was um, second to Uncle Barney and Sam Katz. And um, uh, Uncle Abe left the company before the crash, so I think it was about 1928. And um, uh, Uncle Barney of course, was still in the head of the company, and Sam, I, I don't know how they exchanged the titles or responsibilities, but uh, Dad was always acknowledged because he had, uh, Barney was always the financial, maybe almost genius, he, he was certainly financially very, very bright and astute and advanced, you might say, and Abe was considered the master showman. And Max knew, they said, the most about pictures. And my dad's strength, apparently, was that he was a combination. He maybe he, he didn't know as much about the financial thing as Uncle Barney, or quite as much maybe as Uncle Abe in his area, but he knew enough for all of it. So, um, and I think was so acknowledged. He was a showman, and he loved it. I think they, probably they all did, but I, I used to go to what is known as the screening room. I loved going to the screening room and watching the movies uh, with Dad, with my, take my friends with me, and so on. And of course, then when I was old enough to smoke, whether I should or I shouldn't have, we smoked up there. And of course, that was a treat because you couldn't do that in the theaters, even then. And um, the uh, uh, Dad then, in about 19... Hmm, 30, 31, something like that, uh, went, uh, was transferred to New York. They wanted to centralize everything because Paramount had it now. And uh, they were merged and bought out by Paramount. And Dad went to be the head of the theater division of Paramount. But we, can't, but we came back because I think as much because Dad decided it was more enjoyable to be a big fish in a, in a smaller pond than a smaller fish in a big pond. And uh, so we did, we came back in about 34. Uh, actually, my folks liked New York very much, and I liked being in New York. Uh, and as far as the business side, of course, Sam was in New York then too. And then Sam left. Sam was very smart, I think he was so acknowledged, very bright. Uh, went to, um, after he left, Balaman and Katz Paramount, he went to MGM uh, and he became second in command to Louis B. Mayer at MGM. And I remember visiting and being with him out there as well as in New, uh, in New York. They, they were close brothers-in-law, even though 
uh, uh, the sister to whom he was married passed away before I was born because I'm named after her. And um, the family was very close except when, when uh, Uncle Abe wanted to come back and resume and assume his former position. That's when the, the fight broke up because by this time my dad had moved up and he wasn't going to uh, withdraw for Uncle Abe. And there was a schism, unfortunately, in the family for a number of years. And they really made up, I think, when your grandfather passed away. Everybody came together and uh, Uncle Abe came in and everything. I mean, there had been some contact, but it wasn't terribly close or warm or whatever. But when your grandfather passed away, I, I think it hit them all very hard, and um, they made up, they reconciled, and things were much nicer then again. Well, we didn't see much of them because they lived in New York and we lived here. Is there any, can you have any clue what Dave Balaban did in the company? Yes, Uncle Dave, uh, right. Uncle Dave. Um, he was in charge uh, of the theaters. Uh, he was a like a general manager, and he he was in charge of all the theaters. I remember this. Could you say it again? But say Dave Balaban was his. Kid. Yeah, Dave Balaban uh, assumed the role, best of my memory, of general manager of all the theaters. And I remember he used to go around. He used to joke about it with me a little bit, even when I was a kid. He had to do this, and he had to see to that, and so forth, and uh, check up on everybody. And I thought that was kind of funny. He was cute. He had a funny sense of humor. His, he was always office, very sweet to me. His offices were in the uh, next... They, they, uh, uh, in, you know, where they all were, uh, the sixth and seventh floor of the, the of the theater, of the Chicago Theater. And, um, you know, uh, Grandma Balaban was a fabulous lady. She was a darling, darling lady. And um, they were all very close to her. My father talked to her, I think, every day, as long as she lived. And he adored her, and um, they all did. And they used to catch her because she was very diplomatic. And she would say, uh, uh, the offices would sort of be in line. You, you know, here was one brother and one another brother. Oh, you know what? I want to get this the right way. And because you're moving your hand, I don't oh. want it to be head out. Oh, should so I? Should should I, I have to go a little wider. Well, I, I could no, not. I could not move my hand. No, you're doing fine. I don't want to encumber you. Pull up the pennies more. Hi. Okay. So then, uh, we're, the question is, what what was uh, well, your Grandma gra Balaban like? Well, she was this charming, charming lady, who um, was the most diplomatic and the most encouraging to everybody. So that she had all these daughters-in-law who all adored her because she was wonderful. She was always on their side. If say, if your dad, ha your grandfather had the the first office, let's say, that she would get to, she would tell him that his wife was the most beautiful and his children were the smartest and most darling and so forth and so on. And did he know that one of the other uh, brothers had bought his wife a beautiful mink coat and you could afford it, now you buy Kitty one too, see. So naturally all, <laughs> all the ladies, all the daughters-in-law adored her because she always wanted them to have everything and to do everything and so on. And she was darling with us kids, uh, you know. And she had a wonderful sense of humor. And she knew people, and she understood a lot of nuances of behavior. I remember Grandma and Grandpa, of course, were born and raised, I suppose, as Orthodox Jews in Russia. And when they came here, I mean, I only remember them at 3400 Lakeshore Drive in this gorgeous big apartment where Uncle Barney and Aunt Tilly and the kids lived too. And, um, and I remember going to Friday night dinners, Jewish Friday night dinners, only everybody was dressed to the teeth. My aunts all looked as if they were going, God knows, to some beautiful party. And we kids had, uh, you know, our, I had a you know, silk dress, my brother had velvet pants and patent leather shoes, and we were all dressed up. And the men didn't wear skull caps. The men wore their regular fedoras, or what they call those hats in those days. And I just thought that was natural. I mean, I didn't know that people did anything else but that. And one time, we came back from New York. 
by this time I was about 10 years old or so, I guess. And Billy was, say, seven, and Grandpa had passed away. And Grandma came to the house for dinner one night, holiday time. And she comes into our apartment, which was a gorgeous apartment, if I do say so. And um, we had this great big Christmas tree, huge Christmas tree, and all or full of ornaments and all that. And she looks at the tree, and she looks at my father and my mother, who wasn't Jewish, and Billy and me, and back and forth. And she has this kind of strange expression on her face. All of a sudden, she broke into a big smile. And she said to Billy and me, she said, kids, that's the most beautiful Hanukkah bush I have ever seen. So we thought that she was just, you know, terrific. And she made what could have been a very awkward time a nice time, you know. And I always remember things like that about Grandma. What about um, Israel? Grandpa? Yeah. I, I don't remember him as well because he died when I was about, oh, six or seven. I only remember he was tall and slender and had a mustache and very sweet, very warm. And you couldn't help but love him. I don't think he was as strong a person as Grandma. She was the matriarch. She was the one. She helped, I think, encourage these boys. I think they give her uh, the credit for a lot. My, all, all my uncles, your grand, grandfather and my father, and all our uncles, uh, or your grand uncles. And um, uh, Grandpa, you know, uh, did modestly. I mean, he was an immigrant and didn't have any advantages, but uh, he was an intelligent man. He, he, I, I remember him as being very kindly, but not an awful lot else. Um, what, um, you told me a story on the phone about this, that your mom, tell me the story about your mom and dad meeting. Did, did um, oh. now there was a relationship between your mom and Barney at oh. the cold storage oh, place, yeah. right? Oh, yeah, uncle, uh, my mom. check the camera. Oh. We're about halfway done, you're doing so mm -hmm. well. This is the thing about the air conditioning, right? Yeah. This is this is a story that is, I mean, I have, everyone tells the same story, but you you have the seem like you're closest to the real. Oh, well, you know. my mom worked Mom's at name the what? Bert. The, her real name was Bertha, but everybody called her Bert. She was very pretty, fair and blonde, as was your grandmother, and um, fair and blonde, a, a little heavy, but very stylish, and so on. And she learned that she came from very modest beginnings. Uh, I never knew her father. He died before I was born, about the time she was married, I think. But uh, Grandma Bruder, that was her mother, uh, who was uh, old-fashioned stock from Czechoslovakia, darling lady, wonderful cook, and uh, not as jolly as Grandma Valabin, but also very good and, and kind and all of that. Anyway, they didn't have much money. Uh, my grandmother. Uh, worked in the saloon that my grandfather had, and she cooked. She was a fabulous cook. I don't think my mother, my mother I think helped out there when she was a kid, but when she was old enough to go to work, uh, one of the jobs she had uh, was at the Western Coal Storage Company. I think she was the telephone operator. And she knew Uncle Barney from there. And years later, uh, when they had the theaters, which they had to close in the summertime because they were too hot and people wouldn't go. They were brainstorming one day, all of them, I guess, or Dad and Uncle Barney, Uncle, you know, I'm not sure, and whatever, and they started to think, well, if they could keep the things cool in the coal storage company, why couldn't they do something like that in the theaters? And I think that was really the genesis of um, how the theaters were air conditioned. In the early days, I think they had fans over ice, you know, that sort of thing. And later, the technology developed and so on. And so that the summertime became the biggest season of the year in the theaters because people didn't have air conditioning like they do today. Even today, when everybody does, uh, summertime is still a tremendous uh, time for the theaters. 
And so my mom, I think, contributed to the brainstorming some, perhaps. Not positive, but I think so. And uh, it, they did a lot of innovative things. Because the idea of the movie palaces, uh, I don't say it was entirely original with them, but they are certainly given the credit for it. And they enhanced and expanded on that. On that. The, uh, they wouldn't have popcorn in the theaters for years because they thought it was unsightly and unseemly and messy. If they'd had popcorn in the theaters, they never would have had to sell, sell out to Paramount. They all, they all felt that way. Oh, can you tell me that? Tell that story. What, why, why is that? What, because the, the concessions well, yeah, I, became. I don't want to interrupt you. Yeah. What, um, why? What was the kind of, um, influence of popcorn on this? Well, the selling of popcorn as a major concession was frowned upon because it was messy and dirty, and they were afraid it would mess up the theaters. So they didn't want to do it. If they had sold the popcorn earlier on, they did later, of course they probably would have had enough money so they wouldn't have had to sell out to Paramount. They wouldn't have faced the bankruptcy problems or anything like that. They wouldn't go into bankruptcy. They had too much pride. It was different in those days. They, uh, my dad and Uncle Barney each took personal loans of, I think, a million dollars. They didn't have any money. They lost it in the crash. But they took it upon themselves because they wouldn't go into bankruptcy. That was to them not an honorable good thing to do. Of course, people don't look at it maybe so much that way anymore, but they did then, and they paid it off. It took them a long time, but they paid it off. They were very honorable, ethical men. I, I'm always proud of that because you live in an age where so much corruption seems systemic, and uh, they weren't like that. What are you, um, what are you most proud of about, about the legacy of what, what, let me just, I'm going to sit down again for a second. What are you most proud of? I think uh, the creativity, the integrity, and to use an overworked uh, word, class. They wanted everything to be of the best and suitable for families so that you could walk in with your child or your grandmother and never worry that somebody would be offended by dirty jokes or uh, off-color behavior or anything like that. And, um, but they were very creative and very imaginative and they had these gorgeous shows that they had along with uh, the movies. And they showed, of course, the movies, uh, once they merged with Paramount, they showed, you know, uh, the, uh, Paramount had the priorities. And, um, but they obviously showed uh, MGM and Fox and so on. And they were all very friendly with their rival companies. I know my dad was friendly uh, with the Skanks. One was at MG uh, Low, MGM Lowe's. One was at Fox and, and, and so on. And, uh, so that um, they were mostly all first generation, or not even that. Some of them were immigrant. The Scorises from Fox, they were immigrants themselves. They were from Greece. And I know Dad was friendly with him and Uncle Barney. Uh, Uncle Barney and Spiro Scoros used to live across the Long Island Sound from each other. And on certain nights when they would show movies, they would trade them back and forth so the kids could see them, you know? And um, so that was a very pleasant uh, way. Uh, the name was known certainly throughout the city. And it was like being part of a celebrity family. I, if I, once I gave my name, immediately somebody would say, is that, are you part of uh, Balaban and Katz? But I had a funny experience once. I was a freshman in college and I was taking a humanities course. And the professor asked the class, uh, what kind of architecture such and such a temple was or whatever. And the girls are answering, you know, Babylonian, Ithonian, whatever. And the professor shakes his head and he said, none of that, girls. He said, I, I would say it was early Balaban and Katz. And everybody laughed and I didn't know why. And I'm looking, what's the matter with these people? I'm getting mad because I was brought up to think of that as classic, see? and. Uh, they were all laughing. It was sort of a joke, you know, uh, 
the Byzantine way the theaters were built, and they were, heaven only knows. Uh, but now they're considered great movie palaces. Well, they were then too. In between, they were sort of, I suppose, made fun of and derided to some extent. And um, what type of um, father, uh, if you were to describe your dad, um, how would you um, describe your dad as a father? Oh, you've asked a good question because I thought he was the most wonderful father any girl could have. And now all these years later, I don't even want to tell you how many, uh, I still feel the same way. He was warm and loving and kind, wonderful sense of humor, generous-hearted, generous-spirited, thoughtful, intelligent, willing to listen, willing to learn. He was wonderful. And um, what type of relationship did, uh, did, did Dad have with his brothers and his sister? Well, this, I don't think he ever got over his sister's death. He loved his sister uh, very, very much. They all did. I, I, I would say it, it sounds perhaps a, a little bit much to say this, but I know that they, uh, I know uh, Uncle Elmer never quite got over uh, his sister's death. And this, I don't know as much about your grandfather's feelings and so on. My guess is it wasn't so different because this was the one sister among all the the brothers, and uh, she was much beloved. And what was the rest of the question? Um, how did, what was the relationship? Oh, the brothers with each other. Yeah. Oh, I would say it was a, a warm and loving and close. They had differences and, and disputes and, and, and all of that, but basically I would say it was close and, and warm and so on. And, and, and they mixed, you know, they saw each other. Don't forget Uncle Barney moved to New York. Um, in the middle 30s, and Uncle Abe had moved away even before that, and uh, so and Uncle Max passed away in the early 30s, uh, and their sister had died. So that here in Chicago there was your grandfather, uh, my Uncle Dave, and Uncle Harry and Uncle Elmer, and those are the guys and aunts that I grew up with, and I, w I was very fond of all of them, uh, and and I th and they were always very good with me and very sweet to me. Um, what were the major things that Balvin and Katz, um, what was the, ma the major things that Balvin and Katz created? Well, I think you'd have to say firstly the grand movie palace, the, uh, uh, it's almost uh, a definition of a movie palace is the kind of theaters they created. Uh, they imported marble and so on from all over the world. They had uh, fine architects do all this. Uh, they uh, prided themselves on their service, as I mentioned before about the ushers and so forth. And uh, they had new stage shows every week or two at all the theaters, all like Broadway productions. I know that sounds a little bit much, but that's really pretty accurate with uh, different performers, uh, different uh, costumes, different lighting, different scenery. Uh, they had full-scale productions. They weren't, it wasn't just what they call now, uh, what's the expression for it, uh, like a truck show or something like that. And um, what? Oh, oh you mean, and as far as the theater, and of course the, the best pictures and the best technology for uh, projection and sound and so forth. Why did um, Paramount, um, why did Paramount, why did B&K merge with Paramount? Don't answer yet until I sit down. And again, this is just from your, mm. you know, what do you, what, what well, do you know? I'm going to sit down again. So you, okay. You're doing good. We're almost done. My understanding is uh, that they, they needed more money to run the company. Uh, and the company, I guess, was uh, having difficulties at, at time, you know, time of the crash and so forth. I don't remember. The, the merger uh, came, it sounds like, almost at the same time. I'm not entirely clear uh, on that. And partly they might have anyway, they wanted more money to make more, uh, you know, more theaters and run more. And actually, the chain was not confined to Chicago. It was, they had theaters downstate. And Paramount, and became part of Paramount, they became part of the largest theater chain in America, if not the world. So obviously there's something to be said when a, um, a smaller company becomes part of a major company. There are advantages and maybe disadvantages to both. 
uh, on a typical day when there was a really fantastic show going on at the theater, what kind of things would your dad do? Well, probably, first of all, check on the first rehearsal. I mean, if you're talking about stage shows now. A any part yeah. of the, of the uh, let's, let's take Let's take, for instance, a fantastically interesting show. Well, I, well I remember when Frank Sinatra came. And I was just a kid, and uh, I mean, everything went wild, as you all, almost everybody knows, who's a showbiz buff or a movie or a theater buff. Uh, the city, uh, certainly the Chicago Theater went wild. And I know <laughs> Dad, Dad would check with the guy who was in charge and see how everything was going. Then he'd want to come down and see for himself and so on. And he would get a big kick out of it too. He did, he got a big kick out of it. But he uh, wasn't directly in charge of that. That was somebody else's job. And he picked the good people to do that, you could say. And he had, he had an appreciation of this. He wasn't somebody who was like a bookkeeper, didn't know what they were doing there. He was a showman himself. And he would become involved, I remember that there were a couple of very well-known performers of the day who he would say, I remember one, uh, I don't know if it was Eddie Dutch or something, he said, you have to practice more, <laughs> you know, uh, because uh, you're awfully good, but you have to practice more, but you've got to get this together and so on. But uh, he, he, he liked all of that. He liked showbiz. You know, some people are disdainful of this, uh, if they're the business heads of it or something. They're disdainful of what makes their living for them. But my dad loved all that. As the business changed and the stage shows became harder well, to keep up, how did your dad change? Well, my dad passed away in 57, 1957. And the, the, it was changing then. I'm glad he didn't live to see some of it because I think it would have made him feel sad. Because almost until that, about that time, they were still having, as I remember, stage shows, until just about that time. Uh, he wouldn't have liked the vulgarization that's going on today and really uh, semi-porn pictures and television shows that are on for everybody to see. He would have thought that was terrible that kids would be exposed to this. Um, would he have, I've been asked, would he have done some of this or gone along with some of this? Well, that's hard to say um, because entertainment has changed so much in the last 30, 40 years. But uh, I think, it, I, I, that's not fair for me to speculate, I suppose. Okay, just a couple more questions. Um, what? Um um, what do you, um, how did your da dad feel about uh, World War II? Was he very patriotic? Oh person? my, yes. The day after, uh, Balvin and Katz had an experimental television station called WBKB, uh, which they were operating, you know, 1940, 41, I don't think much before that, I don't remember before that. And when Pearl Harbor came, he had to get permission, I guess, from New York, but he turned it over to the Navy so that it would be, it became one of the great radar schools in the United States, Navy radar schools. In fact, one of my brothers-in-law uh, was a sailor in, in radar so, school. Because um, you're moving a tiny bit more oh. than before. Okay. If you wouldn't mind, this is, I have okay. video of this. In fact, I'm going to give you a tape from that. Okay. Um, if you wouldn't mind just answering that again. So, um, uh, how did your dad feel about, about World War II? And was he very patriotic? He was very patriotic. He tried to enlist. He was already in his middle 40s. And he was very annoyed they wouldn't let him enlist. And he thought he should be an officer because of his background and experience and uh, ability uh, with people uh, as an employer and manager and so forth. But he was over age anyway, and they wouldn't take him, and he didn't have a college education, so they wouldn't make him an officer. He was very disappointed. But he, um, he uh, turned the station, WBKB, over to the Navy to make it into a radar school. And it became one of the great radar schools uh, in the United States. Uh, and he did all kinds of things. And uh, uh, he 
uh, I helped organize the Freedom Train, which probably nobody remembers now, but they had all kinds of Americana that they took on this train all over, all over the country so people could see. He was the, uh, he had a lot of friends in the business, like I mentioned the Scurruses, who were of Greek extraction. And here they, they needed somebody to help uh, to head uh, Greek war relief. And they didn't have a prominent enough person, apparently, in the Greek community. So they asked my dad, and he became the head of Greek war relief. And uh, people used to call us, uh, call him Mr. Balabanopoulos. They thought we were a Greek family because he did that. I think he was one of the first non-Jewish people to be asked to become part of the Red Cross. He declined. Uh, he uh, helped organize the USO uh, canteen here. My mother worked there several days a week throughout the war. And he, I mean, he did, you know, all kinds of things like that that almost, I don't remember all of them now. And um, he was very patriotic. And we always had, it mean, sounds like a little thing, but we always had soldiers and sailors in our home holidays and things like that. And um, he was very proud of Uncle Barney's son, uh, until his son Bert Balaban who had this terrible eyesight. And all the sir, he tried to enlist, and the Navy wouldn't take him, the Army wouldn't take him. Nobody would take Bert. And now, I'm, don't forget, I'm going back to about 1941. Somehow, I never even heard of contact lenses. Somehow or another, he got some contact lenses, enlisted in the Marine Corps, and became a combat photographer. He was great. That's Judy's brother, you know. and. Nobody in our family would have used their position or influence to stay out of the service. I don't think most people did in those days. Most people were pretty patriotic. But um, uh, my brother was too young for the service then. He was in the Korean War. And uh, it, it was a time, of course, World War II. Most people were patriotic. Uh, of course, there were people who tried to get out of things or who cheated in black market and so on. We didn't, we, we abided by all the rules. I, I grew up believing that good people abided by the rules, you know? How did your father get involved in the television business? Well, I think he had some foresight. And um, when a lot of people thought it was nothing, he thought it was going to be something. Uh, and they thought it was a flash in the pan and so on and so forth. But he uh, had the foresight to see that this was going to be an important entertainment medium and that the company should be a part of it. He also wanted to do theaters in the malls and tried to get the company to put theaters in, in the new malls that were begin just beginning to go up before he passed away. But they wouldn't do it. See, of course, now they do. Now they're a, an anchor or a focal point of a lot of them all. So he he had a lot of he had a lot of vision. And generally in life, I would say, and certainly in his business, and uh, he was forward thinking. Uh, he, uh, as sentimental as he could be about the past, he certainly was forward thinking about the future. He was a very special person. I realize I'm prejudiced, but he was. And almost anybody you would talk to who knew him well at all would tell you this. Now, do you, do you have any specific memories of um, WBKB? Did you I worked there? there. You worked there? I worked so. there. During the war, um, I, I dropped out of college in my third year. And uh, all the men that were in the radar school or in the Navy or somewhere else uh, in the service, and except for the, some of the engineers, the whole thing was run by women. And so I worked there. And um, I remember pushing camera dollies and all of that sort of thing. I was okay to do that. I wasn't so good about the lighting, <laughs> you know. And uh, I wanted to write scripts and so forth. And I remember Mike Wallace there, you know. And of course, Irv Kupson, who passed away, who was our big columnist here. Um, and they put on, you know, 
a, a little shows, I suppose you'd say, and uh, news things and, and all that. It, it, as I say, it was experimental, but they were, they were sort of getting there, you know? What years was this? Well, the war years, uh, let's say 41 to 45 anyway, Oh, uh, uh, sorry, maybe even before, I don't remember it before, because I was too young. And do you remember, in later years, WBKB? Well, then that became part of ABC. And uh, uh, Balaban and Katz was part of ABC Paramount. So it was then their station. And, and today, it, uh, it still is, it's a ABC. Uh, uh, where they were is... ABC, which is, you know, American Broadcasting Company. Now, the studios were located across the Chicago Theater, am I correct? In the sta old State Lake building. So what was that like, having the television station across the street from the Chicago Theater? Is mm, nothing special. Uh, the State Lake Theater was down below uh, uh, in, of that building, and that was a, a theater that ran not the most important pictures, but some pretty good ones. My dad would say you can always tell the kind of picture we're showing by the audience that shows up. He said, we may not even, as much as we're supposed to know, he said, we may not know too much about something that's coming in. Well, usually we do, but sometimes we didn't. And he said, you'd see people lined up, and we'd wonder, how did they know, you know, ourselves? Yes, he said, if we had a big publicity campaign, or the a movie, a production company did, then you would expect it. But sometimes they would come in with hardly any notice. But the audience knew. He said, the audience always knows. And... Um, uh, the Chicago Theater was the flagship. They had uh, uh, m mostly light pictures, as I remember it, C romantic comedies and so forth. They didn't have as many serious pictures in those days. Some. How do you feel that your dad influenced the way B and K um, was operated? Well, since he was the head of the company, obviously he would have the greatest influence on how it operated. I, I know that um, it was a large company. They operated at one time about between 50 and 60 theaters in, in the city, all over the city, and in the area, you might say. As I pointed out before, they were very imaginatively run in terms of their productions and so on. In the pictures, they they were very... What should I say? Uh, in, in showbiz terms, scientific about which pictures went in which theaters and for how long. I remember listening to those discussions. I remember listening to a discussion about popcorn. What grade of popcorn? I didn't even know there were grades of popcorn. And what grades of, of butter would be used? And uh, that sort of, of thing, you know? And I remember um, uh, trying to be so careful about everything. And um, one time, somebody asked my dad which was the best theater, or most prof or most successful, most profitable. And everybody expected he'd say the Chicago. And he said the Roosevelt, which is on St State Street, right across from Marshall Fields. Was, Why that? He said because it shows the action pictures that everybody likes and sells the most concessions. He said I would give up my salary, I would give up my job. He said if I could own the Roosevelt Theater, he said you could have the rest. He said it was that successful. And it wasn't what most people would think. It wasn't like the Esquire, which my uncles had, which was a, you know, it was an architectural wonder at the time it went up and showed only very high class and a lot of art theaters. But you don't make a lot of money with art pictures, as we all have found out. And um, he was very proud of his brothers, and he and Barney helped put them in business, of course. And. Um, they were, uh, uh, they, uh, there was a discussion about them putting in concessions too, but everybody did eventually, you know. But I suppose uh, also they were very uh, honestly run. You know, some companies t take things out. We never had so much as an ashtray out of a theater. And I remember when Mickey and Danny were little boys. Uh, they were at uh, the Chicago with my dad and they wanted some candy or popcorn before the movie. And so he reached into his pocket to pay for it. And they said, why do you have to pay for it? Isn't this your theater? Aren't you the boss or something like that? 
he said the shareholders are the bosses. He said, you can't take money like that. This, isn't, this doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the company and other people own the company. And I, I, I never f forgot that. I thought that was such a great answer because when you think about how people are today, some of them, uh, it was a great lesson. I ha always had great respect for this. Has being, um, um, being a, a member of um, the Balaban family, uh, being a member of someone whose dad create, was created this Balaban and Cass company, affected your life? Oh, sure. Listen, you go up where everybody knows who you are because the name is so well known. You can't, I couldn't go to a drugstore or, or anything where they wouldn't know. Uh, that has to influence your life. I, uh, but I believed it was a responsibility to, you know, be in very good behavior because it would reflect on my family and I didn't want anything to reflect badly on my family. I was very proud of them. My mother was a marvelous darling lady and uh, feet on the ground and the success that they got very early on didn't turn her head either. She learned a lot and she and dad both educated themselves to a considerable degree. They didn't have the advantage of that themselves when they were young. They wanted us to have it and I know that wasn't unusual in, in those days, families like that, but I certainly remember it with them. And um, uh, when I, I didn't want to take people into the theater with me. I didn't want to make friends because I was buying them. If they were good friends, then that was okay. Then they would come with me to the screening room or we'd get into the theater, you know, ourselves or something. But I didn't make a habit of taking a bunch of people to the theater because I didn't want that to be the basis of our friendships. Uh-huh. And what, like, I have basically like one question more. So um, what, was, um, what was Judy Garland like? Oh, she was darling. She was vulnerable. She had a, a sweetness. And when I met her two or three times later on, I think there was probably a bit more of an edge, but um, 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 an anecdote which I think is kind of poignant. She was here for the premiere of A Star is Born. Before you start that, or this is like the last question, I'm going to um, switch the thing. Okay. In order to keep to the schedule, what you were telling me is that we should, we should end soon, right? In, a, in, or, in order I, to... I, at, right? least, at least this session, yeah. Yeah. So that's why don't we do that so that we don't interfere with whatever else has to go on. Okay, in five more minutes we'll be done. I just have to. Sometimes I feel like I should ask the, the most important questions first. I mean, so that if you run out of time. Well, you can't. You really need the build up, I think. Yeah, yeah. But you, you're doing you do such a fine job because uh, I've interviewed a lot of people in my life. You know, because I was, I mean, my background is actually in news. Mm -hmm. You know. I worked, I still work at Channel 9 in New York. Oh. You ever hear of Dr. Frank Fields? He's a, he was a newscaster at NBC. Mm -hmm. He's not really a, a, a very, so big, but I work with him quite often. All right, so now that we're winding down here, you were t I was asking you a question about Judy Garland. Um, do you have anything? Well, I met her first when she came to the Chicago Theater. And she and her mother came to our house for dinner. I was about, oh God, 13, 14 years old. She was a year or two older. And uh, that was about the time, or just, you know, when The Wizard of Oz was coming out. And she was very nice and a very darling girl. And, you know, we, I don't know, we just talked the way kids do, I guess. And then I met her a few other times when we would go to California. Somebody would arrange it, Sam Katz would arrange it, whatever. And then she came here in 1954 for the premiere of A Star is Born with her husband, Sid Luft. And uh, Dad, the company, gave her a big party and we had a, a fun time and talking and one thing or another. The next night, Sher and I were out with friends and we spot she and her husband uh, 
at the pump room. And we wa walked by the table. They asked us to sit down and have a drink or a cup of coffee or something. And um, he said to Judy, he said, tell Ida and Cher what you did today. Oh, she said, I, I don't know if I want to. What she did was she hired a car and she went to all the kind of, I guess, flea bags and so place and so forth where she had to stay when they didn't have any money and they were trying to get started in the business, but she wanted to see what everything looked like. And I thought it was kind of a sad story. Here it was this young woman who was a big star and had made money and of course didn't have, never had any money, died broke, in debt and so forth. Uh, there was, of course by this time she was a, a very sophisticated woman and so on, but she was so brilliant. She was she was outstanding when she was a child, for God's sakes. And I think she was, and my dad thought, for that matter, that she was the greatest entertainer this country had seen. And probably still, I don't know any other entertainer quite like this, even today. Um, but she had a sad life besides, you know. Is it, do you have any, um, any other people that were very famous that you got to know? Not like that, I met many. But listen, I'm going to have to go or I'm going to be okay. late for my... F okay. You know. well, can I ask you just one question? And then we're sure. Going. What, um, what um, is the most important thing that you think that people should remember about the battle bands? Well, I would say they loved the city. They were good citizens of, of not only of this country, I think, but of this city, and they made their contributions to it. And they loved the business they were in, and they tried to make it the best, and they really cared about the people they were serving. And I think it's a legacy that all of us kids know and respect and appreciate. And here I am all these years later, and I do too.